greet one another. our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth who have set your glory above the heavens. Father God, thank you that tonight we have gathered here once again by your grace and your providence and really an opportunity for us to be more demonstrative of our faith and to show our love for you, but also, Father, to take your message of the light of Christ into the world. And Lord God, tonight we intercede for our church family. We continue to pray for healing for the Woodley family, strength and mercy and healing for Sandy Carter, for Glenn and Aaron, for Linda Hatley. Father, we lift up all these who are struggling, who are sick, who are having so many different uh, things going on in their life, these that are still traveling from the Thanksgiving weekend. We just lift them up as well. And Father God, for all the things that faces our church in the months to come, we pray your wisdom and your glory upon it. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, good evening. Let me ask you to be seated. Number one, you're aware there's a drainage system being installed at the church, right? Okay. I know Don Reese said we didn't set the mower blades up high enough. That Don't listen to him on anything, but we are putting a new drainage system in the church. And that leads me to the next point. That means we are going, they are not me. I am just supervising only, but we are putting concrete this week and it'll probably be poured Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. 
More pipe will be laid. That means there can be no midweek services. Now, I was hoping to have Wednesday night services, but it, we were real fortunate to have this sidewalk. That sidewalk that you walked in on has already been cut up two or three times and replaced. And so this drainage system is costing a lot of money. So it, we're, we're trusting God for the provision, but it has to be done. So please be in prayer for that continuously. And if you weren't here this morning, uh, Oates Drive Baptist Church turned in 1,780 boxes for Operation Christmas Child, 10,000 boxes collected from the region area itself. And so I, I, I commend you. We give God all the glory and the praise. But you know, there are churches much bigger than us that don't do nearly that much. And don't think I don't fail to, when there's opportunity to remind them y'all didn't even come close in beating us. And they, and Michelle says, you cannot be talking trash to these other churches. I said, if it motivates them to give more, then let it be done. But nevertheless, uh, it, it's not about me. It's just about taking a dig when I can get it. So, uh, but keep praying for that as well. Now, let me give you an update tonight on some folks who are still sick. Uh, Vicki is home from the hospital, uh, but she has still got a long way to go, still having some blood clot issues in the legs, but continue to pray for her. Sandy Carter's been moved to Methodist Hospital in Dallas, so we want to remember her. She, has been, she is on hospice. Uh, Glenn and Aaron, there is a lot of progress being made in Glenn's case. Probably if all things go accordingly, he'll be moved to an acute care facility. And here's what I'm asking you. We, we need help in visitation with these folks. And there is so much going on right now. Uh, I need the help. But we need, if somebody can see Glenn and Aaron, if somebody can, you know, continue to, to, to reach out. Uh, he is able to have visitors. Uh, Glenn, that is. Uh, Vicki is at home. Call, of course, before you go there. But continue to lift the, these people up. In prayer, Linda Hatley uh, will be waiting to hear from the doctors to go to the hospital to uh, have a really, I guess, better lack of term, specialized MRI to, to see what they're going to do about the aorta valve. So continue to lift her up. A lot of people sick, a lot of people traveling this weekend as well. But I'm glad that you're here. So again, no midweek services this week, okay? So stay off the concrete. The only one that's going to get in trouble will be me because one time we poured some concrete here and it said wet concrete and I looked this way and I looked that way and I started to touch it and about that time somebody drove up and said preacher what are you doing I said I'm seeing if it's dry and when the sign clearly said wet concrete when I looked at it nobody was coming. And as soon as I reached over, somebody drove in the parking lot. And that's why he moved. We kicked him out of the church. Okay, so God bless you. We're glad that you're here tonight. Ooh, it's close, though. I can put my hand down and say it was yours. <laughs> Just real quickly, the, the welcoming song that we'll be singing all, all Christmas long, Emmanuel. My wife's, or my mother-in-law, her mother, the man who wrote it, Dr. Bob McGee, they're related to. And I actually took one course under Dr. Bob McGee at William Carey College while I was there. You know?
know what I like about the Christmas season. I noticed it this morning as I looked out here. Some of you will never sing for me. I'll look at you and you just give me this look like, I don't do that. But when it comes Christmas season, everybody seems to sing carols. It's like if you don't sing during carols, you're screwed. And that's one thing I like about the... Uh, it, and I, I brought that. I, I, I brought that. Said that in front of the uh, praise team, and Miss Ann said that's because Christmas carols bring back childhood memories. And as we get older, we we think about childhood memories, don't we? I don't know if I've ever told you this, my little joke about Christmas. Do you know what the difference is between Christmas and a child and Christmas as an adult? For Christmas as a child, it never comes. But as you get older and older, you think, didn't we just celebrate that three months ago? Christmas comes a lot quicker when you get older than when you were a child. But still, that same feeling you have as a child, even though it comes quicker and quicker, you learn, I just get to celebrate it a lot quicker. And how many times have we said that Christmas is year-round? I wish we'd all think that way as an sentiment. It's because of our blessed Savior we celebrate Christmas. If it wasn't for Christmas, there wouldn't be a death on the cross that saved us from our sins. So I hope this time of the season, every time we sing a carol, you think about the cradle, the manger. But you rejoice not only in that, but you rejoice that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for us because of His birth. Amen. Let's continue singing with angels we have heard on. No, angels from the realms of glory.
Gracious Father, we pray that you would be with us tonight. Open our hearts, help us to hear your word. We pray, Father, for our church, for our membership, those that are sick, or those that are in need of your touch, your healing. Pray, Father, that you would give comfort to them, healing, Father, that your will would be done. We ask your blessing upon this time as we return to you that which you have blessed us with. Pray, Father, that you'd help us to go forth and be a blessing to those around us. All this I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.
What a great song and message and music, and I appreciate that so very much. And to God be the glory, and that's exactly what we're talking about tonight. And I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever really adequately been able to define God's glory? Somebody said it would be like trying to count the number of gallons in the Atlantic Ocean, and then you could define God's glory. God's glory is as deep as it is wide. Now, you, you can get kind of a working definition for it, you can associate God's glory with his presence. And the Bible says that in God, there is no darkness at all, right? And in God is light. And you can talk about his power, his all-knowing, all-powerful uh, presence. His, his, he's everything, everywhere. And you can talk about his brilliance and his majesty. And you still can't even adequately describe the glory of God. And I want to tell you the passage tonight, when we talk about this during the Christmas season, it's a game changer. It's a life-changing, and that's the title of the, the message tonight, is the glory of God, life-changing, soul-saving. Because when you talk about the glory of God, to capture it will change the way you and I speak, the way we act. It does everything to remind us that we're not in this for ourselves, we're in it for the glory of God, amen? So let's pray. Father, thank you again that we're able to open your word in a nation that is free, we're able to come tonight through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we're able tonight, Heavenly Father, to be able to study your word that you've given to us without error, without any variation. It is 100% your word, and illuminate it to us now in Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Psalm 96. Psalm 96, because as we talk about the glory of God, and A.W. Tozer captured it perfectly. Get there to Psalm 96, and then I want to read this quote from A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite author, writers, theologians, whatever you want to call him. And A.W. Tozer 
knew a thing about too about being connected with God. And listen to what he said as we turn to Psalm 96. Tozier said, the glory of God always comes at the sacrifice of self. The glory of God will always come at the sacrifice of self. Now, now here's the thing about God's glory. He's holy. He's brilliant. He, he's, he's the light. He, he's everything. He's all truth. And we want to bring attention to his grace and his mercy and his power and his salvation and his, his judgments. We want to bring attention to God. How do we do that? By keeping his glory at the forefront of what we do, what we say, how we drive, how we interact on social media, how we have relationships with our spouses, our kids. We want to bring glory to God. We want to bring attention to him and not ourselves. And I want to tell you that there's the big problem today, and I'm hearing it because y'all will have conversations with people that I won't interact with. And I hear people talking when they have heard from other churches and I read about other pastors and they're bringing glory to themselves. And I hear about Christian entertainers. They want to bring, many of them want to bring glory to themselves. And it's all about bringing glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. When the church fought worship wars years ago, and I say worship wars because there was the battle between traditional hymns, sacred hymns versus contemporary music and praise. I began not to look at whether it had uh, drums or guitars or synthesizers. That's not what defined traditional or sacred or perfect music. The music, whether it brought attention to the glory and the attributes of a holy God. Chris Tomlin is considered contemporary. I've never heard him sing anything that doesn't bring attention to the glory of God. Mercy me, casting crowns. And you go back to the great hymn writers of Fanny Crosby and all these people and George Beverly Shea was a great singer. He did this all. They did it all for the glory of God. They wanted to bring attention to God. And, and you know, not too long ago, uh, I had somebody submit a resume and they wanted to know that if they got it, would it be all right to bring? This was their quote. This was what they asked me on the phone. Could they start teaching dance to youth? See, you realize this is a Baptist church, not Baptist like every Baptist, but we are really Baptist here. And, and here's the thing. I understand what he was doing. He's wanted because from their culture, they teach dance. But what I have seen in churches, interpretive dancing can take attention away from God and put it on the people. When you study the structure of worship in the Bible, it was all about bringing attention to the glory of God. And what is his glory? It's his holiness. It's his very presence. And listen to Psalm 96, verse 1. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Verse 2. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. Before we go any further, I want to direct your attention to the word three times in verses 1 and 2. It's the word sing. Did you catch what Brother Randall was saying a little while ago? about singing. Christmas is not the only time to sing, folks. And, and the idea of singing was an expression of joy because they were happy about something. They were excited about something. Now listen, I've attended enough football games, pro games, college games, high school games, and I can tell you when my team's losing, I don't want to sing the fight song in the fourth quarter. I don't give a flip, okay? I just want to get in and get out. And Bryce and I sat at Daryl K. Royal Memorial Stadium a couple of years ago. And once again, Texas had a lead and blew it in the last two minutes. And they said, aren't you going to stay for the eyes of Texas? Let's go. We're going to the car now. Dad, wait up. He was running after me. I was not in the mood to sing. And the tradition is you stay and sing the eyes of Texas, win or lose, bullcorn. If you lose, I'm out of there. I'm what you call a fair weather fan. I've been a fair weather fan for 40 something years watching those guys. I told you a couple of weeks ago, they, they irritate me. I'm done with them. Get new coaches. Just like the guys in Dallas, get new coaches, right? But I got an amen out of that. But, but listen, I was not in the mood to sing. In the fourth quarter, they have a tradition. They sing Wabash Cannonball. 
They sing deep in the heart of Texas. Everybody was around me going, the stars that bright are big, the stars at night are big and bright, deep in the heart of Texas. And they're singing Wabash Cannonball. You know what? If they would have put the camera on me, here's me in the end zone. Because we're losing. There's nothing excited about singing. That's, I just don't get into that. But let me tell you about the Israelites. Three times they are singing. In Exodus chapter 15, God delivered Israel out of the hands of the Egyptian. And you know what? In Exodus 15, they sang a song of victory and deliverance. Do you know in Revelation, the people gathered around the throne are singing a new song? You know why? Because they've been redeemed. They've got something to be excited about. And, and so when you look at worship and glory, I want you to see why this is important. Number one. The scripture will be on the screen. I want us to see, first of all, God demands glory and praise, and God deserves glory and praise. And these two points I want you to get tonight. He, he demands glory and praise, and he deserves glory and praise. And listen, look at 1 Chronicles 16, 1 Chronicles 16, 7 through 12. On that day, David first delivered the psalm into the hands of Asaph and the brethren to thank the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to, the, to him, sing psalms to him, talk of all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Remember his marvelous works which he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. You catch that? Notice this. Glory in his what? His holy name. Bringing glory to the name of God by our actions, by our songs, by our deeds, what we do, what we say. All this is important. I'm leading up to this because, listen, he's going to get his glory one way or another. Revelation 4, verse 11. I'm going to go through this quickly because I want to get to the main point of this message. Revelation 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now, what's happening? This is around the throne of God, by the way. Have you ever studied Revelation chapter 4? They're singing. Now, in heaven, you know you're going to sing, right? You're talking about that. You're going to sing in heaven. Amen. And you're going to be excited about singing. If you don't sing in heaven, you're not in heaven. Okay? You will shout in heaven. Because if you look at Revelation, they're always worshiping all the time, and their focus is on the Lamb of God. And this glorious image or the glorious presence that they're seeing is the reflection of his brilliance, his holiness, and his righteousness. And you know when God delivered the children of Israel? Do you know what he told them in Exodus chapter 14? He said, I did this to gain honor and glory over Pharaoh and all the people of the earth will know that I am the Lord. Folks, God demands his glory and he deserves his glory. Those two points are inseparable. And why is that? Because he's going to show the world he is God and there is none other. He tells us in Isaiah, I am the Lord, I will not share my glory with another. This is why when I've watched some of these hyped up, steroid induced services on TV, these fake faith healers, and I have seen people, there used to be a church in Plano, I'd watch it, and these people would just run all around the pews and they'd be falling out. And you've seen some of these healers where they, they will on somebody and they fall over. And what I always laugh about, and unfortunately it's tragic, sometimes they'll touch someone and the guy won't fall over. It's like, oops, I forgot my line. And you know what? It doesn't bring glory to God. I look at that and I think that's, you know, my father-in-law would worm animals when they acted like that. And, and, and so they're just completely bringing not, not attention to God but to themselves. And notice here though in Revelation, they're singing unto the Lord. They're saying, you are worthy to be praised. Luke 2, 14, y'all know this one. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Did you get that? Why does God deserve to be worshiped? Glory, why does he demand? You need to understand what happened that night. The dark sky was illuminated with the glory of God, wasn't it? The message of Jesus Christ was brought forth. Now, I want you to stay with me because here comes the message. 
Now, you need to understand that glory to God in the highest. Folks, there's no other God but Jesus. Why do we say glory to God in the highest? Because he's doing something no other form of religion could ever do, and that is to save the souls of men. Why is it glory to God in the highest? Because the source of salvation didn't come from the earth. It came from the highest source of authority, heaven. That's part of the glory of God. Now watch this in Psalm 96, and we're going to show one more scripture in just a moment. But look in Psalm 96, verse 3. And why is this important? Because you're going to see that he demands glory and praise in verses 1 through 6. Now we've already read verse 3, but look at verse 4. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. This is why God demands glory and praise. It's because of who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to do. Now think about this just for a moment. When you enter into a sanctuary, when you enter a time alone with God, what's the first thing on your mind? Is it, what am I going to get out of this time with God? What are you going to do for me, God? Or is it, God, what can I do for you to bring glory and honor to you? And, and folks, people who are sick still can bring glory to God. People who are broke can still bring, bring glory to God. People who are in wheelchairs can still bring glory to God. We've witnessed it right here in our own church. Allow me to repeat something I've repeated for a number of years as an illustration. And we've had men in our church that have walked in here on hospice, stricken with terminal cancer, with feeding tubes, with catheters, and still showed up Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday nights, and still went out and visited, and still went to deacons' meetings. And sat right back there where Barry is sitting. And they showed up. They weren't going to stop. I said, well, you need to be home resting. They said, hey, I want to do what God has called me to do. I'll never forget, he teamed up with another guy, this man who had a bag on him, a colostomy bag, who was on chemo, would still go to the hospitals and visit. And you know who drove him? A man who was in a wheelchair. And he'd have this, one of those lifts on the back of his truck that he'd just push these buttons. Y'all remember this, some of you? And he'd grab that wheelchair out of his truck and it would sit down. So here comes two guys visiting, ministering, praying, witnessing, handing out tracts. One's in a wheelchair and one's got a bag on him. One's dying and they're still ministering for the glory of God. So you can bring glory to God regardless of what situation that you're in because you want to bring attention to him. And notice what they're doing here in verses 4, 5, and 6. The Lord is great and greatly to be praised. That is magnification. He is to be feared above all gods. Not that there's other gods in the sense of literal existence, but there are other gods that people worship. They, verse 5 says they are idols. And then he goes back to the creative power of God. And then I want you to see something else, how God deserves praise and glory. Look at verse 7. Give to the Lord, O families and of the peoples, give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Years ago, a songwriter named Babby Mason wrote a song called All Rise. Y'all ever heard that song? There was a holy hush all over as I entered in the room. There was the, only the sound of angels. And she talks in this song how she could sense that it was like a heaven was about to be opened up. And she was going to be standing not before Moses, not before Peter, not before Paul, but standing before the Lord. And she said, all I could sing in this song was, all rise, all rise. All rise in the presence of the Holy One. All rise, all rise. And I want to tell you that when that song was sung at an evangelism conference, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. But then I'm going to tell you what happened. Because I, I saw it as a pastor and I saw it as an attendant of a church when I was just attending. I watched how a music minister, and I watched how a staff member at two different churches would go to people before the service. 
Now, when he sings all rise, you stand and you stand and you stand and you stand. And then y'all remember the song years ago called, that's what this altar is for. The service is coming to an end. The choir is singing gently, just as I am. And one by one, they're coming. You know what one music minister did, his wife? He went out and told the people during that song, you go and pray and you go and pray and you go and pray. That's not glory to God. That is simulating false worship. Because if you're moved by the Holy Spirit, you're going to come. You don't have to have somebody tell you. If you're going to give glory to God, you're going to do it not because you're, you're, you're having to do it as a religious exercise. They are doing it because of who God is, what God has done. Now, what is our personal responsibility? I want you to look in Psalm 86, 11 through 12 on the screen. Teach me your way, O Lord, and dawn will walk in your truth. Is that what it says? Unite my heart to fear your name, and Randall will praise you. Is that what it says? What does that say? I. Notice this. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord my God, and with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forevermore. When the shepherds heard the message of Jesus Christ, what does it say they did next? Hey, that was pretty cool. And they went back to the fields. What did they do? They made haste and they went to Bethlehem to see this thing which had been revealed to them. They went to Bethlehem. They focused. And when they got to Bethlehem, they focused. When you go into the church of the nativity, you better lower yourself and squat down as you walk in because if not, you're going to bump your head. And even though our tour guide said, Watch it. Lower your head when you walk into the church of the nativity or you're going to bump your head. Some people weren't looking. And people were bumping their heads. You know why? Because you need to lower yourself to worship, folks. And in the church of the nativity, there, there's two sites that they believe there's a spot that Jesus was born in, in this manger, this animal trough, if you want to call it that, really a stone cutout. And when you're sitting there and you're knowing that this area, separated by a wall, right there in that area is where the Son of God was born. There's no talking. There's no laughing. There's nobody going on. And our tour guide said, somebody lead us in a song. And guess what? Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the night. And you're standing there and you realize this is where the Son of God made his entrance into the world. And folks, if you're non-believers, you're still standing there in awe because all the thousands of people that go through there are not believers. Trust me, there's a lot of unbelievers that tour Israel for the historical value of it. But when you go as a believer, as a Christian, and you're standing there, and they've got that spot marked, and let's say they're 10 feet off, but somewhere in that area, Jesus was born. And if you can't worship the fact that Christ came, as Brother Randall was saying, if you can't worship except at Christmas, something is dreadfully wrong. Because these people are singing, Lord, you're the creator. Lord, you're holy. Lord, you are worthy. You're the one true God. You're not the God of idols. Man, aren't you glad you don't worship a tree? Years ago, Michelle and I, her brother, uh, gave us free flying passes to go to California. Pretty amazing. We went to Disneyland. This was before it got all goofy. No pun intended, okay? But <laughs> I promise that wasn't planned. Most things I say aren't planned when they go off script like that. And some of you will get goofy a little bit later. But anyways, we went there, and that second morning, that hotel was just a sway. It was an earthquake. I called the front desk. I said, hey, we're from Texas. What's going on? Oh, we're having an earthquake. Okay, I'm from Texas. What do we do? Oh, just stay in your room. It's fine. Sir, this hotel was just built five years ago, and it's on rollers. Okay, I'm from Texas. Where are we rolling to? She said, oh, you'll be fine. We looked outside the hotel, and you could see pieces of the facade flying off. I thought, this is great. Her mom called. I answered the room in the, ho the phone in the hotel. She was kind of upset, but me not wanting to miss a point. She said, Jim, are you all okay? I said, oh, yeah, fine. As soon as we dig out, we'll be fine. 
Not a good thing to say. But later on, as we looked out, we watched Asian citizens, and they were doing this in front of a tree. They were doing this. Not one, not two, but about 10 of them had gathered there, and they're worshiping this tree. Probably Buddhist. And I asked, I said, what are, and I kind of knew. He said, oh, they're giving thanks that the great spirits have delivered us from this earthquake. I am so glad that if that earthquake had been fatal, we didn't depend on a tree to save us. We'd be in the presence of Jesus Christ. I didn't think so. I know so. That gives God the glory. They're giving here in verse 7, or verse 5, 6, and 7, they're all worried about the idols and all the different things. So here's several ways we give God glory. Number one, we know the truth because he's revealed it to us. He's revealed his truth to us, not just at Christmas, but 365 days a year. I don't have to worry about which God is right. And I've been asked that question a lot as a pastor in recent months. How do you know your way is right? It's not my way. It's Jesus's way. How do you know Jesus is right? One lady said, well, I was raised this way and I was raised to believe this and that. I had one man tell me as a mission pastor, he can't profess his faith in Jesus Christ because his mom was a Scientologist and he made a promise to her he would never go to a Bible or a Protestant church as long as she was living or dead. I said, but I'm telling you here, this is about Jesus. No, but I made a promise to her. So you're going to go to hell for the sake of your mother. Folks, I don't love anybody enough to want to go to hell for them. And, and, and you understand that this is, we know the truth. God's revealed his truth to us. He didn't hold back. He didn't cloud it. He didn't obscure it. He has revealed his truth to us. And we're responsible for receiving that truth and acting upon that truth. Remember the Psalm 86? I I, I, it's about me. It's not about the church. It's about what you do. Number two, we not only know the truth, we need to live the truth, we need to speak the truth. And that is in how we conduct ourselves privately and publicly. Because we want to bring attention to God. I'll never forget, in a church a lot bigger than this one, a lot wealthier than this, don't take offense to that, but when a, a family of a different color and creed came into our church, and this man, one of our leaders, said, we're very conservative here, didn't know what he was trying to say. Even happened here a number of years ago. Not quite to this extent. But this man let this person know, we're very conservative here. I asked him, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, you know, blacks need to worship with blacks and whites need to worship with whites. That didn't bring glory to God. There was no recovering the service from that point forward. The only thing that would have recovered that service is that man to repent, get right, or get out of the way. Because right. he hindered the spirit that day. And that, that is insane. That is so stupid. And yet today, we need to speak the truth. We need to live the truth. We need to act upon it. A third way is by our actions. In Colossians, we are told whatever we do in word or deed, do it all to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, this is hard. You want to change your life? You want to change your ministry? You want to change how you're a parent, a grandparent, a husband, a wife, a mother, an aunt, or an uncle? Think about whatever you're doing. Is it going to glorify God? Does it bring attention to the Lord Jesus Christ? I mean, there, there are churches... One, a man here in our church, we were just talking about it before. One guy just kind of believed the Apostle Paul was not all right in his evangelistic techniques, that he needed help, that Paul did some things wrong, and the Holy Spirit needs help. The Holy Spirit does not need our help. But can, can you imagine, though, because we want to grow the church, we're going to start coming in with some fog and smoke and colored lights. Now, we did that July 4th. My, my wish is to have indoor fireworks 
on July 4th, but I don't think many of us could handle that, you know. I, I want tanks in the front yard at July 4th. Now that we're getting a drainage system, we might be able to do that. Don't know what that's got to do with it, but it's a thought in my mind, you know. If I had my way, I'd have parachute guys jumping from the skies, landing, you know, bringing an American flag. That, that's once a year. But can you imagine, though, to try to stimulate growth, fog machines and colored lights and all this hip-hop stuff? Do you know who grows the church? The people don't. The pastor don't. The Lord Jesus Christ does. And we do this with the focus to give him the glory. Show our commitment to him and everything that we do and everything that we say in our finances. Boy, come January, we're going to lay out, a, a, it's not a new vision, it's an old vision. It's a vision that's just as biblical as it's always been for the church. Time to step up, time to get commitment, time to be committed, time to think that whatever we're going to do, whatever we're going to say, whatever we're going to put in a budget, whatever we're going to class we're going to teach, whatever we're going to do, we're going to do it for the glory of God. And it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to challenge people. It's going to challenge me. I need to take a long, hard look in the divine mirror and see what I'm doing. Is it glorifying God? Am I seeking to bring attention to man's techniques, myself, or am I doing it to bring glory to God? Because what you do when no one else looking still counts before a holy God. He sees all. Remember that song? Oh, be careful, little hands, what you do. Oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. For the Father up above is looking down below. Oh, be careful, and then so forth. And that's still, that's a very powerful song. I heard a, a man preach that in Bible college. I thought, you're kidding. I'm a junior. I'm almost educated. And this guy's going to preach this in chapel? And he's just a good singer, and he sang the song. Oh, be careful, little hands. And then he asked us to turn to Jeremiah. He says, do I, the Lord, not fill the heavens and the earth? Do I not see everything about you and all that? And boy, I mean, the Holy Spirit moved that morning. A bunch of guys from Bible college going down to that altar and praying. The chapel lasted well into the next hour of class. I was happy because the next class was Hebrew. And it, it went, they had to cancel the class because God was moving in this chapel service. I was thankful to the Holy Spirit for, for the message. And secondly, I was giving God the glory that Hebrew class was canceled. You think I'm kidding? I was so happy. I didn't have to worry about going to class for two more days because Hebrew was twice a week. Two hours long. Who enjoys Hebrew that much? But you know what, though? God was moving that morning. All the classes were put on hold because it doesn't matter what the church sees you do. It doesn't matter what other people see you do. It only matters what God sees you do. God knows who you are. Other people think they know who you are. You think you know who you are. God knows who you are. And give him the glory. Am I going to bring attention to who God is by what I do, what I say, what I think? I want you to know that I spent in one day, I spent eight hours solid filling out information. I'm telling you this for a reason for a grant for our church, free money grant to help us with the drainage cost. Eight hours in one day. That's, it's just mind boggling. And I mean, taking 45 minutes, saving it, going to eat real quick and coming back. And this morning when my emails got locked out and, and then I, I lost everything on that application. Finally, it was able to be recovered. And when that representative from AT&T told me well, it might be several days. It could be up 30 days. We don't know what all's going on. You don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on. And, and I mean, if you could have seen me in that office, and even today on the phone, puffs of smoke were coming from my ears. If I could raise my head up, there would just be nothing but fiery flames inside my brain. But you need to realize something. I had to realize it. Stay calm. What's those stickers? Keep calm and pray. Keep calm and keep your mouth shut is more for me and pray. Because I don't know who I'm talking to on the other end of the phone. I just dealt with somebody who keeps wanting to charge this church $170 a month for something we don't even subscribe to. 
And I said, and finally, I had already had to talk to him. I was just getting so irritated. And finally, this last time I was saying, please cancel our account. Please cancel our account. Please reverse these charges. Please do this. You're not getting your money. We don't know this. You didn't give it to us. We don't want it. You know what she said? Why do you want to cancel your account? That's because you're charging us for something we don't subscribe to. What if we send you a 25% coupon? I don't want a coupon. I want this off the account. Let me switch you to someone else. Then let me switch you to someone else. And she said, well, this is the wrong department. <laughs> At that point, there's no smoke. It's a volcano in full force here. But you got to realize something. I'm trying to bring glory to God. Plus, y'all went and hired my wife as secretary, so I'm really boxed in here, okay? But, but I'm trying to bring glory to God because you don't know who you're talking to on the other end. Now, this is, this, this is the pot calling the kettle black here because let me tell you why. Because I, I will, if people try to take advantage of this church, I, I get froth with anger. But you understand, I still have to bring glory to God. And I've always not been good at that. Let me just be honest with you. Because, I mean, I get irritated, and I reach my boiling point. Somebody asked me this morning, well, I didn't know we were doing a drainage system. Yeah, we've talked about it for a long time. And it was an honest question. I said, but it needs to get done. Oh. And they said, well, how much is it going to cost? I said, how much you got in your bank account? <laughs> and she said, well, I don't have that much. Well, how much do you think it costs? She said, that's what I was asking you. I said, well, just whatever you got in your bank account will cover it. But all honesty, listen, we owe it to him to represent him to a lost and dying world. And what you do when no one else is looking is going to go a long ways in bringing glory to God. Because if you don't get it right privately, you're probably not going to get it right publicly in the long haul. Sin's going to find you out. I'm going to ask you to stand tonight as we go into time of invitation. With heads bowed and eyes closed. May we have the prayer, the heart, the attitude. Like Daniel in the lion's den, who gave all the glory to God, who still insisted on praying. Like Stephen, who was being stoned to death and still gave glory to God. May we have the prayer and the attitude and the desire that whether we're preaching, teaching, singing, attending, giving, that we want to bring attention to him. We want to call attention to his attributes, who he is. May that be our prayer tonight and every day of our life. One of the ways you can bring glory to the Lord is to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and receive him as Savior if you've never done that. Because you need to believe and admit that you're a sinner because we all are messed up. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. You need to believe with all your heart that Jesus indeed is the only one who can save you and he proved that by dying on the cross and shedding his blood for you. He took your the wrath that God has in store for sinners because of his holiness and righteousness. He took it from you. But as a Christian here tonight listening, we all need to realize in inventory, are we committed to God to bring in him glory? And once we get this principle down, It'll not be a question of whether I should be to church or whether I should pray, whether I should read my Bible. It will be doing exactly what God says to do. Our Father, speak to our hearts, convict us, motivate us, drive us to honor you with all that we have, with all that we say, and all that we do. In Jesus' name. Brother Randall sings, the altar's open. I will pray with you, for you. Maybe you want to come to an altar and pray. The church today faces a serious commitment issue. Not just our church, but all churches.